Hello, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to be attempting the Try Not to Cry Challenge. I know this has been done before in other communities, especially the whole Try Not to Laugh Challenge, uh, but today I am going to read some books that you guys on Instagram said made you cry. I'm gonna see if they make me cry. I put all the answers that y'all gave into an Excel spreadsheet, and I'm going to be reading the top five most voted for or like most recommended books, and I'm going to be reading them from least likely to make me cry all the way up to most likely to make me cry, and I'm going to be ranking them on a scale of one to five, and if a book hits a full five, Five, that means that I am no longer going to be doing the video. If I get a full-on sob, that means that the video is over. So I'm hoping that I can read all five of these books without shedding a single tear. I'm going to see what, what happens, but let me tell you first what books we're going to read and what the scale is that I'm going to be grading these books on. So the first book with six votes is We Were Liars. I know little to nothing about this book except for I do know that it's on my physical TBR already, and I think this might be kind of set in the summertime. Obviously it's got kind of like a beachy cover, so I'm assuming this is about like a pack of friends and something tragic happens? I don't know. I guess we'll see. Up next, we have They Both Die at the End with eight votes. I know this is about two different boys who are slated to die in the society. You kind of figure out when you were going to die. You get to, you know, be sent a text, essentially, and they decide to kind of link up, spend their last day on Earth together, and I heard it's really tragic. It's really sad, so I guess we'll see if I cry or not. A book that I am not as excited to read just because I'm not a historical fiction fan is The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna. This book, I think, had 10 votes, which is kind of a lot, so I'm curious to see if this one makes me cry or not. A Again, I'm not a huge like World War II history fan, so I kind of don't think this is going to make me cry, but I'll be interested to see if it does. With 14 votes, we have A Thousand Boy Kisses by Tilly Cole. You know, I never thought that a romance would be on this list. I've heard that it kind of has like a sick lit element to it. I don't know if that's true or not. I actually don't know a whole lot about this book in general, but I have seen it on many a best of list, so I guess it is high time for me to read this one. And then lastly, I'm sure you guys know what book is going to be the one with the highest amount of votes, and I'm hoping and praying that that I actually don't get to this one. Like, on the one hand, I do want to get through this entire video without shedding a single tear, but on the other hand, if shedding a tear for a different book means I don't have to read this one, that might be a good thing. Anyway, with 53 votes, we have A Little Life. I'm not gonna lie, I'm terrified of this book, but it seems like a very popular one. I know a lot of people say that this book is maybe a little bit too much at times, so I'll be interested to see if this is one that I actually end up picking up, if this is one that is going to make me cry. And the scale that I'm going to be using to grade these books is a one, which which means this is absolutely nothing, a two which means I feel absolutely nothing, a three which means I let a singular tear loose, a four which is a silent weep, and a five which is a sloppy sob. So we'll see if any of these books get a five. I kind of don't think that they will. I would love to know your predictions in the comments down below, what you think is going to make me cry, and what books you think are going to get what ratings. I don't know. Let me know. Uh, but let's, you know, without further ado, let's get into the vlog portion of this video, and let's see if I cry on camera. <laughs> I'm 50 pages into We Were Liars. I'll put a picture of it right here, but I'm reading it physically. I just don't have the cover on it. I wouldn't call this tear-inducing. I would call it strange, and I definitely anticipated exactly how this book would feel. It's perhaps a tad stranger than I thought it would be, but it is reading exactly as I thought it would, which is interesting because I've never before read any pages of this, and I haven't read a ton of exhaustive reviews about this book beyond just reviews that say, what the fuck is this book? I feel like this is one that has a twist ending or something wild that happens at the end that everybody just seems to love. So how to describe this? It is very much what I had anticipated it is about the Sinclair family and the summers that they spend on their private island called Beechwood. Now, our main character who's narrating the story, her name is Cadence. She is the eldest granddaughter of the Sinclairs. She goes to Beechwood every summer and hangs out with her family, her cousins, and this boy who has come to hang out with them as well. He is like the nephew of one of the stepdads. So no relation to Cadence, but she has a crush on him. And that crush develops quickly and it burns and fizzles quickly as well. That's kind of what we found out. There have been a lot of instances of imagery, which I think is probably the most interesting thing and something that I feel like is foreshadowing. There is a scene at the very beginning of the book when Cadence's father leaves her mother. It says, he pulled out a handgun and shot me in the chest. I was standing on the lawn and I fell. The bullet hole ripped wide and my heart rolled out of my ribcage and down into a flower bed. Now, the more you read of that, the more you realize that it's not something that's actually happening. It's just how Cadence is feeling. But I think as the story goes on, some of the things that are going to happen, we're going to wonder if they have actually happened or if it's just imaginings. I kind of feel like the end of this book is going to be Cadence perhaps 
self-harming or something and I feel like it is actually going to be real. So the whole story you're kind of wondering like what's real and what's not and then at the end I think you're supposed to feel that too but also kind of feel that she's done something. Could be completely off here. This story could go in a completely different direction as I'm only 50 pages into it but that's where I'm at. I will say uh, again it's not really tear inducing if anything this is very much rich people problems but I wouldn't say it leans too heavy into that besides Cadence calling her mom mommy. Other than that it's just a story that is kind of strangely written very short choppy sentences and it's just about Cadence's experiences navigating who she is as a person, navigating her summers on Beechwood, kind of coping with the things that have happened. Um, she had a particularly bad accident one summer after contracting hypothermia and now she's having memory loss issues and I'm wondering too if she is going to be an unreliable narrator as a result of that. So I don't know, this book's kind of all over the place. It's a little bit weird but I'm kind of enjoying it. I like that it's reading quickly. Again, curious to see where this goes, curious to see if the kind of strange writing style will develop into something that is going to make me care for Cadence, care for any of these people, and ultimately cry and care about the ending. I don't think it will. I mean, we're starting tame, but stranger things have happened. I mean, I hope I don't cry because this is only the first book, but that could be kind of fun. Maybe? I don't know. I'll, I'll edit you guys as I go. Okay, I'm like, no, could you stop, please? Anyway, I'm about 151 pages into We Were Liars, and it's gotten increasingly weird. So I think I mentioned it in the last clip, can't remember for sure, because uh, much like our main character, I also have some memory loss. So that's really what has come to light and what is really making a big impact on the story. Our main character, Cadence, aka Katie, is really suffering from memory loss from the summer she was 15 and something tragic happened. Pretty sure I told you guys she had hypothermia, which she did suffer from, and along with that uh, she also is suffering from memory loss. Now, she knows that something happened that summer, but she doesn't know what it is, and she does mention to her cousin that she thinks maybe she was a victim of an assault or something, and that's perhaps why she can't remember anything. She knows that the amnesia wasn't because she like hit her head or something, so it's interesting, and I I'm surprised. Okay, the writing is what I expected in that it is kind of strange and kind of choppy, but it is reading more like a thriller than I expected it to. I thought this would mostly be kind of like a fake deep story and then it would try to really pull on your heartstrings, but so far it really is just a story about Katie trying to figure out what happened to her, figure out the secrets, I guess, of the island and the people inhabiting it because no one is telling her the truth. She keeps asking them, what happened to me? What happened that summer? I know it was more than just what happened to me. Like, I know other things happened that summer and just no one's sharing with her. So it's interesting. Is it tear-inducing? Absolutely not. But I will say I am starting to care more about Katie as the book goes on, which is a good sign because, you know, if something tragic does happen or we find out what happens that summer, I think I'll care. So it is interesting to me though that I, I still have absolutely no idea what could have happened to her, even though I am about 58 pages from the end of this book, which is so weird to think about. But I think what I'm probably gonna do is just finish the book update y'all, and um, if I'm crying at the end, I'll, I'll show you my tears. Probably not gonna happen though. So I finished it, and uh, I didn't like it. I don't think any of us are really that surprised. I'm gonna give this two stars, which I believe I am calling I Didn't Feel Anything, which I think is an accurate way to describe this book. It didn't do nothing, but it didn't make me feel anything. I have to spoil the book to really be able to go into details about what didn't work for me, but I think that's a risk I'm willing to take. I think that's something that we are gonna have to do. So I'm gonna put a spoiler warning, and if you don't wanna hear the spoilers, you can skip ahead to the next time marker. Okay. Okay, so essentially, Katie couldn't remember anything because her selective amnesia was telling her that her cousins and her friend were still alive. However, they're not. She killed them in a fire. That's that's the spoiler. That is what this book is about. Essentially, it is Katie remembering the fact that a bunch of rich people problems were happening. The sisters, aka like the parents of these kids, were fighting over who would get what property when the grandparents died. The kids were sick of it and they were like, you know what? We're going to set fire to this house. And Katie's like, hell yeah, let's do it. Actually, it might have been Katie's idea. Regardless, she accidentally killed her two cousins and her boyfriend slash friend in this endeavor because she was too stupid to know what to light first. I mean, is it really that stupid? Who knows how to commit arson in a good way? But that's that's what happens and at the end of the book. She says she's going to endure and I don't know if it's supposed to kind of be this like not twist ending, but if you're supposed to think that like maybe there's something else here or like is it supposed to be twisty? I don't know. Maybe I'm misreading it. I guess the saddest part that happened is that not only did she kill her two cousins and her friend, but she also killed her grandparents' two dogs in this fire. So like, yes, that is quite sad. However, we never 
get to see the dogs at all in the story. And like as much as I love dogs, it's gonna have no emotional impact on me if I don't even know anything about these dogs. I'm not really understanding like why people were crying about this. Like besides the dogs, what's there to cry about? I was not attached to any of the characters. I liked Katie more and more as the story went on, but I just don't feel like she was really it for me. I don't feel like I connected with her on a, a deeper level and her whole like giving away objects as the story went on thing was irritating. I also don't like that racism was a part of this story, but it never really got addressed either. I don't like that at the end of the story, the grandpa is just tolerating the like stepdad or whatever. Cool. Like after a tragic death happens, now you can tolerate someone who's not white. I don't, mm, not cool. It just, it was not handled well in my opinion. I, who am I to say what is handled well and what's not, but it just didn't feel handled well to me. Overall, I think it's safe to say that this book just wasn't for me. It's a two-star read. Didn't make me cry, if anything. Made me like a little bit irritated. So I think I'm ready to read something that might actually make me cry. You know, we're, we can only go up from here, maybe. So I'm going to start in on They Both Die at the End by Adam Silvera. I've never read an Adam Silvera book, so I'm kind of excited to get into this one, but I'll update you guys once I know a little bit more about the story, since I know very little except for the premise of this book. <laughs> I'm 79 pages into They Both Die at the End by Adam Silvera, and so far, I think I'm enjoying it. I don't know if I'm like loving it, but I am enjoying it. So the first chapter didn't really like because I'm not a huge fan of Mateo as a narrator, but I am a fan of Rufus and I am kind of interested in where the story is going. Now I can definitely understand why people would cry at this book. The concept is definitely sad. It's called They Both Die at the End and I'm assuming both of the characters are going to die at the end. It is about Rufus and Mateo. They are both called the night of their impending deaths to be notified that they're going to die. No one knows how or when, but sometimes that day they're going to die. They can do whatever they want the last day of their life. I mean, probably, preferably not commit a crime, but there are like special privileges offered to them since they are dying. They can try to meet up with other people who are also dying if that is something that they wish. They decide that, you know, individually they want to spend their last day on earth with someone who's also dying. So they go on this app called The Last Friend. I say that because the second part of this book is called The Last Friend. They find each other and they're going to spend their last day together. We get a little bit of backstory for both of them. They both have tragedy in their past. Rufus's parents died in a car accident that he was a part of. I think they like drowned. His whole family drowned and he was in the car but somehow lived. And then we have Mateo whose father has been in a coma for two weeks and by the time he wakes up Mateo will no longer be there. And also Mateo's mother is dead. So they definitely have like pretty rough pasts and you know they definitely have room to have other people in their life. Now Rufus like lives in a group home and he has like two best friends and he has good foster parents and like he's made mistakes but he has has, you know, people in his life. And then Mateo is the more of the standoffish one. He has been like in his room for like half the day on the day he's going to die just because he doesn't know what to do. And yeah, it's, it's been interesting getting their points of view. I like that they're very distinct. Hi, Nugget. <sighs> Every time I pull out this camera, he decides he wants to rub his face against it. Anyway, like I was trying to say, I'm appreciating the distinct voices between Rufus and Mateo, even though I like Rufus more than Mateo. I think they're going to be a good pairing. I think they're going to work well together. And I'm curious to see like what life lessons I learned from this book, because I think that's sort of the intention, right? Like you were supposed to want to go out and live your life and like live it to the fullest. After reading this, I'm guessing that's kind of the point of it. And I'm already getting hints of that. There's already been some like one-liners and other things to kind of get you to feel something. So I don't know. It, it's not like, two in your face is not frustrating me because that is something that frustrates me when books like try to have a moral message. If it's like too strong, I'm like, shut up now. This is fine, but maybe that'll change. Maybe it'll get annoying. I, I don't know that this will make me cry, although I do think these characters are more developed than the characters in We Were Liars, but that's not saying that much because those characters sucked. Uh, I'll be back whenever I'm farther into this book, probably the 50% mark, but I don't want to make any promises. I know I said I wouldn't promise y'all anything, but I am 50% into They Both Die at the End by Adam Silvera. Holy shit, I filmed that intro like three times because I could not for the life of me remember the title of this book. Not that surprising because the book itself is not all that memorable. I feel bad disliking two books in a row. I don't know that I would go so far to say that I'm like super disliking this one. I just feel like there's sort of some wasted opportunity and some sort of like missed opportunities here. At the beginning of the book, I felt like it was super promising because we had Mateo and Rufus coming together and they were going to accomplish things on their bucket list and spend the last day of their life in a really fun and fulfilling way. I can't say that it's unrealistic the way that the story has been going, but it's not something that's super compelling to read. At this point, in the middle point of the book, I'm feeling sort of aimless and a little restless when reading it. So they have knocked off the things on Mateo's wish list or bucket list and 
and Rufus doesn't really have anything that he is trying to accomplish. So now the two of them, the pair, they are kind of stumbling around New York trying to figure out what to do. We had them go to this sort of like Make-A-Wish Foundation type thing, but it's like for people who are dying that day. And you can do risk-free activities. So you can like swim with sharks, but risk-free because you don't want to increase the chances, I guess, that you would die early or, or whatever. And so it's almost like a VR type thing. They go do one of those. I think they do like skydiving or something. And now they're kind of just aimlessly walking around the city. I just, I don't know. I appreciate, I guess, the realism there. Like I wouldn't know what to do on the last day of my life. And you know, you can't go on these grand adventures or travel or go anywhere particularly interesting if you only have 24 hours left to live, if that, because they don't tell you what time you're going to die. But I just feel like I, I want something more there. I want there to be kind of a point or a purpose or just something driving the story forward. And besides the fact that these two characters are dying, there's not really a lot driving the story forward. And from a reader's perspective, that's kind of boring. And I just don't know if <laughs> this book will redeem itself enough to make it something that's going to make me cry. It's not super poorly written. I'm not upset reading it. I think this definitely reads better than We Were Liars, but I'm just kind of underwhelmed. I think we are on an upward trajectory though. I think this is probably gonna end up being like a three star read. And then maybe the next ones will be, you know, going up from there. But I don't know. I'm just kind of like eh, at the moment. And I don't want to keep talking about how it is just mad because I feel like I'm wasting both of our valuable time by doing so. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep reading the book. If there's something zesty to update you on at 75%, I will update you. If not, I'll just update y'all at the end and we can carry on with The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna. Kind of a spoiler, but I did just start this book last night. I just wanted to kind of get into, you know, the audiobook because that's the medium that I'm going to be consuming that book through. I don't know. I don't know about that one either, but I'm gonna go ahead and finish this one and then then we'll move on to the nightingale but so far no tears okay so i'm not crying clearly but my nose started to burn a little bit at the end of the book you know when you're like trying to kind of like hold it back so i think i'm gonna count that as like a three star single tier sort of situation it ended up being a lot better than i thought it was going to be at that 50 percent mark i was very unsure but then everything just slowly kind of came together and i really feel like this is a really solid book and i think if i were in the ya age demographic this might be a book that would like truly truly impact me that being said i feel like the issue I had with the direction of the story, at, or lack thereof, I guess, kind of solved itself. Both of our characters ended up learning a lot about themselves, taking chances, and righting wrongs. It felt really satisfying when you get to the end of the book. It was really sad, obviously. It felt like a good ending for what the story was. So I will spoil it now because that's just how this is probably going to go for the rest of the video. If you don't want to hear spoilers, skip to the next timestamp. But yes, both of our characters do die at the end. One of the deaths is a little bit more up in the air than the other, but Mateo ends up dying from smoke inhalation. I think he looks like going to make tea or something after him and Rufus have like cuddled together and like, you know, basically not spent the night together, but slept in the same bed for a few hours. He wakes up to make them tea and something goes wrong with the oven or the stove and he ends up passing away from smoke inhalation. Rufus, we don't exactly know how he dies, but he does leave the hospital where he was being treated for smoke inhalation. He crosses the street without looking both ways. So I guess we're to assume that that is how he dies. I felt like the sexuality um, discussion was, was nice. It wasn't even a really discussion. It was just uh, Mateo comes out throughout the course of the story and he forms this connection with Rufus. And I have to say, I didn't think that I would enjoy this kind of one day fall in love situation, but I think given the seriousness and the heaviness of, you know, dying, I think it could be a lot easier to admit your feelings for someone when you don't think you're going to be here the next day. So it didn't feel weird. I think there's probably a lot of reviews saying like, oh, it's kind of an insta love situation. Okay. But like if you were dying and you met someone who you felt really connected with, you might fall in love quickly. Right. So I felt like that was nice. I did like, again, how Mateo was able to kind of fully accept himself, how he wanted to come out to his dad, how Rufus ended up coming out to Mateo's dad for Mateo because Mateo passed away before he could do that. I feel like I should have some like really, you know, zesty things to say, but I just don't. I I kind of enjoyed this book. I'm surprised. I sort of expected this to be a two-star read for me. I'm pleasantly surprised. After reading it, I was like actually thinking, am I going to unhaul this? Which is a good sign because usually after finishing a YA contemporary lately, I'm like, yeah, this is going in the donate bin. Not in a bad way. It's just like most YA stories aren't really for me at the moment. I can still kind of get with why fantasy, but why contemporary doesn't really do it. But I do think this was pretty introspective. I don't think it really told you how to feel, but I do think it kind of left you with the message like, hey, you only have one life, live it to the fullest, etc. So kind of cute, kind of liked it. Three stars. Uh, now we get to read The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna though. I posted on my Instagram story <laughs> that I was reading it and that prayers were welcome. I got so many replies to people saying either they didn't enjoy this book, that was kind of the minority, or a lot of people saying that they cried and good luck. So fingers crossed, maybe I will cry this time. I don't think it's gonna happen, but maybe. <laughs> So I was trying to think of a preamble for this, like an introduction to kind of like ease you guys into my feelings. But to be honest, I don't think that I have it in me to do that right now. 50% Into the Nightingale by Kristen Hanna and I really don't like it. 
at all, not even a little bit. If you watched my most recent video, which was tropes and things I hate in books, I specifically said that I don't enjoy World War II historical fiction, right? And I was willing to put that aside for this book because everybody says Kristen Hanna is amazing at writing historical fiction. So I was like, you know what? Sign me up. I'll do it. If there's anyone that is going to make me care about this time period, I mean, not that I don't care about this time period, but if anyone is going to bring something new to the table and make this interesting, it's going to be Kristen Hanna, right? Okay, no. <laughs> That's not the case. I just really don't like this. The sad thing is I own Four Winds or whatever her most recent release was. And sometimes when I read a book and I know that it's not for me, I can overlook that and I can, you know, maybe get interested to read another book by that author. But when the writing is the problem, it's really hard for me to kind of like summon the courage to read more books by this by this author or by an author that the writing doesn't work for me. Anyway, how to describe this? Soulless? Is that mean to say? Probably a little bit, but that is how I'm feeling. The characters and the things that they're going through are definitely hard and tough and difficult, but I just can't seem to care because of the way the book is written. It feels very detached, like you feel very detached from the things that are happening to the characters and they don't even seem to be very attached to what's happening to them. Two characters who are in, you know, very dangerous situations in Nazi occupied France, but it doesn't seem immediate. Like the danger doesn't seem that immediate, even though it's like literally looking both of the characters, the main characters in the face. And I'm like, how, how is that possible? If anything, it's like impressive the way that she is able to make me not give a shit about either of the characters. I'm just, I'm at a loss here. And I was, like I said, willing to overlook the fact that I don't like World War II historical fiction for this book. I was like, you know what? This is going to do it for me. Like I'm going to cry. I'm going to be blown away. And you know, I don't want to speak too soon. I don't want to speak too soon because I kind of felt that way a little bit about they both die at the end, right? I was like, you know what? I don't, this is whatever. It's fine. Sure. But I did end up having some emotions there, but I could, I could see little like breadcrumbs throughout the book that were going to lead me to that place. But there are no breadcrumbs here. Trail is dried up. There's nothing here to make me care. I'm sad about it. So well, let me tell you what the book's about. Uh, it's about Vienne and Isabel. They are sisters in Nazi occupied France. At the start of the story, they're both in very different places. So their mother died when they were both quite young and their father had different ways of dealing with them and the girls had different ways of dealing with how the dad dealt with them. The eldest daughter, Vienne, ends up getting pregnant at 16, getting married, and she is living a quaint little idyllic life in the countryside, right? Her sister, on the other hand, is much younger than her and was kind of shipped off to multiple different schools because her father didn't want to take care of her. So neither of the girls have a very good relationship with their father, but they also don't have a great relationship with each other because while Isabel was living with Vienne for a while, Vienne was dealing with postpartum depression and kind of kicked Isabel out for a while. So now it's much later and Isabel is, I think, 19 at the start of the story. She decides that she really wants to help with the war efforts or like the anti-war efforts. So she is kind of helping communists and other people try to fight against the war which, you know, pretty cool, pretty admirable. I appreciate it. Vienne, on the other hand, is kind of doing her own fighting at home a little bit. She has a Nazi in her home who she is having to shelter, I suppose you could say. Like, he's living in her house and she's just trying to survive. I'm just irritated with both of the characters. I think it's really, I mean, I'm bored, but I'm also irritated. So Vienne is kind of like spineless in a way. I just don't seem to really give a shit about her. I'm not really understanding the point of her storyline. I thought that like both of the storylines would be equally interesting or like have zest to them and that's not the case. And then Isabel is naive. We've got spineless, then we've got naive. Isabel is just like, you know what? I'm gonna help the war effort. And it's like, I'm not saying that people didn't do that back in the day, because clearly they did. But for someone who's so sheltered to go from that and then try to immediately help war efforts and like not be scared of dying, it's a little interesting. And also I don't think she understands like the, the full consequences of her actions. And multiple characters have told her, hey, you're kind of being dumb and she just doesn't listen. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I'm 50% mm, I'm into this book and I'm just like, what? I thought I was gonna update y'all like multiple times. And yet I've had nothing to say until this point, And I still don't have much to say, as you can tell. I'm just like, characters kind of suck, kind of bored. The writing's kind of like, meh. Like, this is the kind of historical fiction that I personally don't like. It's trying to tell a human story, but it's just not really doing that. Or at least it's not doing that effectively. So it's reading almost more like a textbook, but it's also a story because it's about two different people and it's not just like about the war in general. So this is this is a surprising turn of events. The other two books that I've read, I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna like these. I'm expecting not to like these. This one I was like, I'm gonna like this. This is gonna be an outlier. And it is most certainly not that outlier. That's all I have to say right now. I'll probably just update y'all when I'm done because I cannot foresee me having a lot to say before then. And we still have two books to go, so. Welcome to my car. Thought we could do with a nice change of scenery for my final update on The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna. This one, I will say kind of went in the same direction as 
they both die at the end in that I did enjoy it more as the story went on. However, it's still going to be a two-star read for me. It just didn't do what I needed it to do to redeem itself. So I am going to get to some spoilers. If that is something that you don't want to hear for this book, go ahead and skip to the next timestamp, but I'm going to get into the nitty-gritty and really let y'all know how I feel. So this one's really tough for me because I do feel like this didn't fall into the pitfalls that I normally have with World War II historical fiction, but it still didn't redeem that sense of I feel nothing for these characters that I needed it to do. So we have Vienne and Isabel as the story carries on, and both of them really end up in helping positions for their country, and I thought that was really cool. Isabel is someone who's helping pilots that land in France who need to get home or like need to get back to their country so they can start fighting even more or like fighting again, I guess. She takes them to Spain, I believe. Like that is her goal. And she is the nightingale because she helps, you know, in the dead of night bring these men across the border. And she's still in leagues with this guy that she's had a crush on. So that's kind of her story. Vienne is having to have Nazi soldiers at her house. I was really scared that we were going to have some sort of like Nazi romance in the story. And I was really, really not into that prospect. Thankfully that never happens. Vienne does have one Nazi that she has in her home for a little while who she does develop feelings for, but she does end up murdering him. Don't know how strong those feelings really were. Unfortunately, he was replaced by a really, really evil guy who ends up sexually assaulting her and a pregnancy results from that sexual assault. So that's kind of like her personal journey, but she also ends up helping a lot of Jewish children be able to stay in France because at the end of the book, essentially, things are getting worse and worse as the story carries on. First, it's just people who are foreign born have to go and leave if they're Jewish. Now it's even French people who are Jewish have to leave and go to these concentration camps and eventually it's going to be Jewish born children and so Vienne wants to obviously prevent that because she knows a lot of her friends have left their children behind so she ends up saving a lot of children getting them forged documents and things like that like that's kind of her journey so she helps children Isabel helps pilots and they're both special in their own way which I appreciate I think that's great and along the way they do develop as characters I don't think at the end of the story Vienne is this kind of like spineless person and I also don't think Isabel is quite as naive as she previously was so I I did appreciate the character growth there. But I think really where the story just falls short for me, and I've, I've said it time and again for this book, is it just doesn't make me feel anything. I think that's really largely a result of how the book was written. I mean, it's not from first person point of view, so I really couldn't connect with the characters on an emotional level. Even when these horrendous things are happening to our characters, I just couldn't care much because even they don't dwell very long on their emotions. We really don't get much insight into their emotions beyond maybe like a, a sentence or two. You're left feeling like, well, if it wasn't that important to you, why should it be important to me? I wanted to like this. I felt like the story itself was fairly compelling. I do think it was maybe a little too long and could have been cut down a little bit at the beginning, but I don't think this was a terrible story. It just definitely wasn't one for me. I'm curious to see if Kristen Hanna's other books are the same or if maybe they will be emotionally closer to the characters and maybe like I would like another of her books because it's not that this was poorly written or anything and I'm sure this works for a lot of people. In fact, I mean, it's got like over four stars on Goodreads. I'm assuming it works for a lot of people, but will her other historical fiction work for me? I guess we'll see. I'm gonna read Four Winds later this year, so I guess I guess we shall see. But that's kind of where I'm at on that. I have started A Thousand Boy Kisses, so let me kind of tell you about that one. <laughs> Okay, so A Thousand Boy Kisses is already off to an interesting start. I'm enjoying it more than the starts of pretty much every other book that I've read, and that's probably because this is a romance, and I like romances. They tend to work more, and they tend to make me more emotional. I was trying to tell Hayden recently, or he was asking what kinds of books have made me cry in the past. When I was reflecting, I realized most of the books that have made me cry in the past have been romance, and I don't know if that's because I read so much romance, or if it's simply because romance tends to get to me more. I don't know. But this one, I could definitely see potentially me crying. And I say that because there are some books that have similar premises to this one that have made me cry in the past. So this story is about Poppy and Rune. I don't know if it's Rune or Rune, but the audiobook narrator says Rune, so we're going to go with that. He is from Norway and he comes to Georgia and befriends Poppy very quickly. She asks if he will be her best friend, her person. They quickly form a friendship. I think they're like five years old or something at the start of the story. I could be totally off on those ages. Don't quote me on that. But they are just friends and just the best of friends as the story kind of carries on. We get the little prologue of them when they're young and then when they are 15 is kind of where the story picks up and Poppy and Rune are in love and could not be separated and all of their emotions and feelings are super, super big. I think a lot of people are saying it's cheesy and unrealistic, but thinking back on how I was personally in high school, especially around the age of 15, I can definitely see how they would feel this way for each other, especially if they've been friends for so long. He is a photographer, she plays a cello, and they just have this like 
like emotional connection and bond. It's not super well developed or super well explained, but I got enough from it that whenever Rune has to go back to Norway with his family for two years, I definitely felt for him and I definitely understood how he felt having to leave behind his one true love as he tells his dad. So the beginning of the story is very angsty and heartbreaking. We have Poppy's grandmother dying at the beginning of the story and giving her this jar of paper stars and she said, this is your jar of thousand boy kisses. Anytime you get a really memorable kiss, write it down and put it in this jar. So far, Poppy has only had kisses with Rune and they're just, you know, made for each other. So a lot of like cheesy shit has happened, but it hasn't been like horrible to read about. I've been kind of enjoying it. So now we are into the present. Now both Poppy and Rune are 17 and Poppy has just made the admission to us as readers as to why she has not stayed in contact with Rune for the two years that he was in Norway. There's going to be spoilers for this book. If you don't want spoilers, just skip to the next timestamp, I guess. Poppy makes the admission to Rune when he comes back that the reason that she hasn't been talking to him for two years is that she is dying. She has an aggressive form of cancer. She only has a few months to live and she didn't want to put Rune through that. So she didn't tell him and she didn't keep in contact with him. And Rune is upset because he didn't know why she didn't talk to him for two years. So the story thus far is very angsty, very overly emotional, very teenage, but I'm not hating it. I don't know if I'm going to cry. I made, you know, hint or I alluded to the fact that I definitely cried at a similar story. I read The Fault in Our Stars in high school and sobbed like a little bitch baby. So I'm wondering if this is going to bring up similar emotions. I kind of don't feel like it was because that one felt different. You know, that one had like kind of a twist almost that was like, oh, heartbreaking. This one, it's like, I know in advance that Poppy's dying. So I don't know if the story is going to have the same punch, but Rune as a character is very intriguing to me. So I'm hoping that maybe he will be someone who keeps me interested in the story. This one's kind of promising, but I'm also like a little hesitant. I'm only a quarter of the way into the book. So I don't want to like get ahead of myself, but my intention is to finish this one today. I'm actually on my way to go grab dinner. After I grab dinner, I will update y'all when I get to 50% because we're going to keep the energy going and we are going to finish this book today. Hopefully we're going to get some tears because I really don't want to read a little life. Like I, I really don't. I'm not going to force the tears to come, but I'll be back at the 50% mark. I feel like it's a running joke on my channel at this point that I'm just like completely incapable of finding books that I actually enjoy, but I desperately want to. Like truly, it's not fun for me to read books that I just don't like and I'm kind of at my wit's end at this point, but this book turned out to be a fail for me. It wasn't the worst thing that I've ever read. I feel like if you're going in with certain expectations, this could definitely be something that you could enjoy. If you enjoyed The Fault in Our Stars, but you wanted it to be even more romance heavy and you wanted it to be childhood friends to lovers, this is this is your book. This is a book for you. I think the shortcoming for me was nothing really happened. I guess that makes sense given the kind of story it was, but I just wanted something more. There was not a whole lot of plot going on, not a lot to keep me interested, mostly just a lot of Rune being sad and Poppy trying to cheer him up during the last moments of her life, which is not fun to read about, honestly, at the end of the day. Like at the beginning, I was like, oh, that's kind of sweet. Uh, but the whole story carries on like that and you get to slowly watch Poppy die. It just was not fun. It was not enjoyable. And I didn't expect it to be fun or enjoyable. Like it's supposed to be a sad book, but nothing about it made me really connect emotionally. I would definitely say this one tried really hard to tug on your heartstrings. I think this was like overdone in comparison to The Nightingale in terms of like emotional connection. Like they were really trying to bring out the emotions in you, but it just didn't do it for me. And then the ending is really the killer. I was going to give this book three stars because I was like, you know what? It's not for me, but this is a fine book. But I think the ending slash epilogue is really kind of what took away my enjoyment. So at the very end of the book, we know that Poppy dies. I mean, that's just kind of, you're leading up to it the whole book and it happens. So Poppy dies and then we get her and Rune kind of reuniting in a dream 10 years later. And you're like, okay, this is sweet. It's nice that he has a way to connect with Poppy, although it does kind of seem a little strange that he's not able to move on. Like that's a little worrisome for me, but whatever. Um, and then we find out that not only does he see her in his dreams frequently, this last dream that he's having is him in heaven because he's died. 10 years after she died, he dies too. He lives a short, good life is what Poppy says. She, she like knew he was dead or whatever. I guess that's just like her omniscient heaven powers or whatever. So now they get to spend eternity together. I mean, I guess that's one way to do it happily ever after for a romance that like shouldn't have one otherwise, but wow, I did not like that. There's no explanation given as to what happened to Rune. And I don't like, I think the message of the story. Now I've not had a significant other close to me die. So I don't want to come off as if I'm telling people who have had a spouse or a loved one or whatever die, like how they should feel or whatever. But I didn't like the message here that if your first love dies, that you can never love anyone again. And they both promised each other that they like wouldn't love anyone or kiss 
notice anyone. Poppy in heaven is like, you know, you could have moved on if you wanted to. And he was like, no, you're the only person I could ever love. Like, I guess it's like romantic, but it didn't s send a great message, I don't think. There's so many people out there to love. And I think most like spouses and stuff would say if they had passed away, I want my spouse who is still living to find happiness and find love again. But just, it felt a little weird. And I mean, I guess they're teenagers. So like that love is a different kind of love, honestly, than anything else. But like, I don't know. I just don't think it sends a great message, especially to like teens that might be reading this book. Yeah, that kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. And overall, it just kind of felt like the fault in our stars. He takes her to New York at the end of the story to like fulfill her last wishes. It was just kind of whatever for me. And again, that ending is really what dropped it from a three to a two star for me. I don't hate it as much as a lot of people seem to. I don't have like strong feelings about it. It just wasn't really a book for me. <laughs> yeah, that's where we're at. That's that's what we're vibing with today. I guess I'm going to be starting a little life uh, tomorrow morning, bright and early. A nice Thursday treat for me. <sighs> I'm scared. So I think it'll come as no surprise to anyone that I am not gonna read this book. I tried, I attempted this morning to get into it. I got 1% in before I sadly DNF'd this book. It came with a lot of trepidation on my part. I really wanted to read this book since I know so many people have such strong feelings about it and it seems to be a book that is very divisive, which to me is always fascinating. I always want to know why people really hate or love a book. For me to DNF it so early on, I felt a little guilty about it, so I did some research to kind of find out more about this book. I had read a lot about what it was about prior to going into it, but I was like, I really, I need to know more details. I watched an hour-long interview with the author to kind of understand what the intent was behind this book, and I can safely say that I probably disagree with a lot of the more negative reviews of this book. However, that is not reason enough for me to continue on with it, if that makes any sense. So I think it's interesting to see how people feel about this book. I read some reviews. Yeah, I just meditated a lot on, you know, whether this was something I want to carry on with, and while I respect the author's intent with this story, and while I can appreciate some of the themes, of friendship and how sometimes life just doesn't get better for certain people. I personally don't tend to connect with those sorts of stories and I also don't think that the way the story is written is something that would really ultimately impact me. I have similar issues with this one that I did with The Nightingale in that I feel like there's a certain level of detachment with the writing style and I feel like this was written in a slightly more pretentious way. You can feel free to disagree. I know a lot of people think the writing of this book is beautiful and I can't argue with that. I mean, I didn't read enough to really be able to argue that. Even if I had, I don't think I would argue that, you know, it was not beautifully written. I just... I don't think it's the kind of writing that I personally connect with. Yeah, I, I guess ultimately I really was struggling with the difference between like authorial intent and if that is like reason enough for me to read a story because I definitely think the intent behind this novel is interesting. I just ultimately don't love some of the depictions that I know were present in this book. I think you can read things that you disagree with, absolutely. I just personally tend to like stories that are a little bit more hopeful than this. When I went into this <laughs> video, I didn't think that I would learn so much about my reading taste and would learn so much about the sorts of stories that do and don't make me cry, but I'm actually very happy with how this video went. While I didn't end up really loving any of the books, I feel like I learned a lot about what tends to make me cry, what tends to make me emotional, and just the sorts of stories I like. I kind of beat myself up a little bit when I make videos and I don't like any of the books that I read in a video, but honestly I think it just leads me to a place of knowing better what sorts of things I like, so ultimately like I am actually kind of happy with how this went. So yeah, it was, it's been an interesting experience and I did want to leave y'all with something beyond just me DNFing <laughs> a little life. So I thought that I could tell you guys the last five books that I know for a fact made me cry and I think you'll be surprised at this list and maybe you will find something to become emotional about. I don't know. My list. Uh, first up, I have two romances that I've read most recently and both made me cry because something about a perfectly crafted puzzle piece romance just works so well for me. Seeing two characters, even if they are fictional, come together is beautiful to me. I love seeing people in love and love stories are the ones that tend to make me cry most often. So for this recommendation, I have Twice Shy and Tools of Engagement. I've talked about both of these books in various videos over the past couple of months because they just truly impacted me deeply and I love a story that can surprise me like Twice Shy did or just really be so intensely relatable like Tools of Engagement was. Again, these are not like traditional stories that would make you cry, but I was crying happy tears when I read these books. I got emotional. I teared up. I loved both of them so much. So if you haven't picked either of these up, I would highly recommend them. I mean, there's issues with both of them. There are issues with every book out there, but they deeply impacted me and maybe they will deeply impact you. Uh, next up is one that is a more traditional, like meant to make you cry kind of story. And that is A Monster Calls. I was surprised at how much this book
book impacted me. It's a story about grief, so I feel like I probably should have expected to be so deeply impacted, but I loved this book, and I think if you were looking for something that is pretty straightforward, but at times also subtle, I think you'll enjoy this one. If you are at all triggered by death of a loved one, definitely don't pick this book up, but I think if you want to understand how people process grief, and you've actually not ever had anyone close to you die, I think this could maybe get you to understand what that might be like. Maybe you don't want to know what that's like, but if you do, I think A Monster Calls is just an excellent symbolic story, and I think could be impactful for anyone of any age demographic, because I think this is a YA book, but love this one. But next up is another, next two actually are romances. I have Edenbrook by Julianne Donaldson. Something about the main character was just so intensely relatable to me. Her insecurities and the way in which she connected with her sister was also kind of like jealous of her sister. Not that I'm like jealous of my sister, but I think everybody kind of has these insecurities they have within themselves, and sometimes, you know, when like siblings are pitted against each other, there can be sort of this sense of, you know, they're better than me in that way. I don't know. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but this book just really did it for me. I cried a little bit, and I mean, it's such a triumphant, sweet story. I think if you want a really, like, sweet, tame romance, this is perfect, but it also just deeply emotionally impacted me, which is why I recommend it so much. And then lastly, one that also made me cry. I mean, these all make me cry. Uh, the Bride Test by Helen Huang. I just loved the way the characters came together in the story. It really subverted a lot of tropes that I tend to not like. There is a hidden child or secret baby element to the story, and yet it didn't lessen my enjoyment of it. I just, I really, I love this one, and there is such great representation as well, so you can't go wrong picking this one up. So yeah, I don't know. I had a really good time filming this. I hope that in watching it, maybe you got something from it. Maybe not. Maybe this was just a slog to get through for you. I don't know. But thank you so much if you've watched this entire video. Video. I really do appreciate your view. I love you guys so, so much, and until next Sunday.